Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, Your Excellencies, uh, Your Excellency Mr. Yakesh, uh, fellow young leaders, fellow participants, it is an honor and a pleasure for me to welcome you here today uh, for the first day of our conference, the Ankara Conference on Peace Building and Conflict Resolution, Using Cultural Diplomacy as a Tool to Build Sustainable Peace. My name is Mark Donfried. I'm the director and founder of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, which is based in the United States as well as Germany. Our main headquarters are in Germany. And I'm really happy today to be uh, hosting this conference in partnership uh, with, first of all, the ARI movement, uh, which is one of the leading NGOs in uh, Turkey that uh, you may be familiar with. Also, TOBB, uh, the university that will be hosting us also uh, the following two days, as well as the Ministry of Finance. Uh, I'm very grateful that we can begin the conference today in the Ministry of Finance. Uh, I think it's a very fitting solution especially given the, the economic challenges and the economic uh, opportunities uh, that are facing us when it comes to peace building and cultural diplomacy. So for many reasons, I think the, the constellation of partners has really helped us to keep also the conference quite interdisciplinary in nature. So thank you very much to the partners. And I'd like to just say a few words uh, of welcome uh, discussing the issue of cultural diplomacy. Just two, three minutes, and then I'll turn it over to, uh, to Mr. Batu. Cultural diplomacy is a field which is rapidly developing. Many of you might be familiar with some of the classical forms of cultural diplomacy, uh, such as the Alliance Francaise from France, or the Goethe Institute from Germany, or the British Council uh, from Britain. For a long time, cultural diplomacy was actually dominated by governments and by the public sector. And for a long time, it had the reputation, or let's say the, the goal, of quote unquote, winning the hearts and minds of foreign audiences. Uh, how do we persuade others to like us? How do we attract others? Uh, how do we give a positive image of the United States or a positive image of Germany? Uh, in particular, the Cold War period was really the high point of this, where it was really one entire way of life kind of competing against an entire other way of life. Uh, and really, cultural diplomacy, in many ways, you could argue, was propaganda, or it was advertising. Uh, and I think that's what we would classify at the Institute as old school or classical cultural diplomacy. As we look at the conference title, uh, Peace Building, and conflict resolution. It's hard to imagine propaganda or persuasion as really helping us in peace building or conflict resolution. If I'm just telling you how great I am, if I'm just telling you about my strengths, that's not really good to build trust. At the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, we feel that relationships, whether it's between a man and a woman or two countries, uh, need three things in order to be sustainable. Dialogue, understanding, and trust. And for us, that's the most important. If we want to do peace building, if we want conflict resolution, if we want to really strengthen any kind of relationship, we need trust. It doesn't mean we have to agree with each other. We can have different opinions, but we have to understand each other and we have to trust each other. And that's why at the Institute, we're always asking ourselves, right, if the goal is really to build trust, how do we do it? Uh, maybe we need to rethink uh, the mechanisms. We need to rethink the strategies. Maybe it's not enough just to tell people how great we are, to talk about our strengths, to talk about our successes. Maybe we should also talk about our weaknesses. Maybe we should also talk about our failures. Maybe we should also discuss difficult things, you know, human rights, etc. Things that very often were taboo. Uh, usually when we talk talk about cultural diplomacy, it's just the nice things about music or design or culture, this and that, which is wonderful and fully legitimate. And I think they continue, you know, the, the work of the existing institutions, please, uh, there's no problem. But there, there really is a need for more. And so these are some of the issues that I'm hoping we can really deal with in the next three or four days. Uh, to try to ask ourselves, first of all, what is cultural diplomacy? And I'm looking forward to our keynote address this morning, uh, Mr. Yakish, where I think he'll give us a few insights there. Secondly, what can cultural diplomacy be? Uh, we really need strategies that fit to today's interdependent world. Uh, for a long time, countries really the end goal was fighting for independence. Uh, once you were independent, you were free, and that was the end of history. Uh, I think we're quickly learning that's really the beginning of history. Uh, if you want to fight for your independence, great, go for it. No problems. Uh, but as soon as you're independent, realize you're actually part of an interdependent world. And as much as you want to be free and do your own thing, you can't. And if you want to make any kind of progress when it comes to peace building, when it comes to climate change, when it comes to poverty, many of the global challenges facing us, the only way we can make progress is together with actually collective strategies. And I think in that context, cultural diplomacy also takes a very specific meaning. It's no longer just promoting my own goals or my own culture, but it's much more about humility, much more about listening as it is speaking, much more about really building building that understanding and trust. So I'm just mentioning this to you to clarify. I think when we talk about cultural diplomacy at the Institute, we're thinking much more uh, than just the classical forms. Uh, I think we, we want to obviously embrace those classical forms, use those, those mechanisms and those vehicles the best way we can. The ultimate goal, though, 
is really how can we educate, how can we enhance, and how can we sustain relationships. And by educating, enhancing, and sustaining relationships, we hope we can come closer to relationships that actually do have sincere understanding and sincere trust. And I think especially when talking about the Mediterranean region, uh, here we are also in Turkey. I think Turkey has a special responsibility, especially now since the Arab Spring. Uh, really the entire world is looking to Turkey, and, uh, many countries also as a model in terms of how also new democracies that are just emerging around the world, whether it's Northern Africa or elsewhere, are looking at why is it that Turkey is so successful? Why is it that Turkey really has accomplished so much when it comes to not only peacekeeping, uh, but also in terms of economics and beyond? And I think in that sense, to hold this conference here in Ankara and in Turkey is also a special honor, especially right now at this moment in history uh, where many eyes are looking to Turkey. So for many reasons, I'm really honored and uh, grateful uh, to have the chance to be here in Ankara uh, to host this conference. Uh, with me, uh, I'm purposely coming here with one mouth and two ears. Uh, I really want to listen. I really want to learn. I'm hoping we can engage. I'm hoping we can disagree. It would be boring if we always agreed. Uh, I would ask us all to obviously be as respectful as we can when having our debates and having any disagreements. Uh, and I think uh, if we succeed there, we can really learn a lot. We can challenge each other. And hopefully we can come away from this conference with some new insights and some new perspectives uh, on maybe old questions. In the sense, the questions we're answering are not necessarily new. Uh, the context, I think, is new. And I think that's what makes this very special. So thank you very much to everyone who has come. Some of you at great distances. I think we almost have every continent represented. Uh, I was on the plane with one uh, young leader alumni coming from Los Angeles. I think we also have others from the African continent, also from Asia. So I think that will really help us too, uh, the interdisciplinary mix, but also the international mix. So thank you very much uh, for you all being here. Uh, and I welcome you to Ankara. Uh, before we uh, begin, I would like to give the chance also for our partner uh, to say a few words. Uh, it was really a pleasure also uh, to work together with Arda Batu uh, over the last weeks and months. Uh, as you know, I'm, or you may not know, but I'm American in background, based in Berlin. Uh, so for me to do something in Turkey was difficult, in the sense I'm not Turkish, I'm not based in Turkey. Uh, and in that sense, it was really wonderful uh, to have someone like Arda the entire time, just to bounce ideas off of, to, to check things, to get feedback, uh, to help in terms of locations, in terms of partners, in terms of speakers. Uh, it was really a, a vital uh, partnership for the success of this conference. I'd like to tell you a few words about Arda, uh, and then also allow him to say a few words of welcome on behalf of the Ari movement. Arda Batu is the vice chairman of the Ari movement. He studied political science and international relations at New York University and at Bogatsi uh, University. He completed his internship at the European Parliament and got his master's degree from Marma University's European Studies Institute. He's also a lecturer at the Yadipa University in the International Relations Department, and as I mentioned earlier, vice chairman of the Ari movement, uh, the editor of the chief uh, of the Kalem Journal, and is on the editorial board of the Turkish Policy Quarterly. He's also an associate partner of Istanbul-based consultancy company, firm Strategy Co. So please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Mr. Arda Batu. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, introduction, Mark. Uh, yeah, it was a great pleasure to collaborate with you over the past few months and uh, hopefully we'll see the fruits uh, in the next couple of days. I'm really eager and I'm really looking forward to participating in this program. Uh, civil diplomacy is a, is a key component of the NGO that I represent, Aru Moments, and we are uh, uh, based in Istanbul and working to uh, expanding on the idea of civil diplomacy and uh, exposing this idea of civil diplomacy in Turkey, uh, a notion that we very much need, not, not only for Turkey, but for the, you know, the near abroad and the greater region and, uh, around, surrounding Turkey. Um, we conduct a number of programs, uh, you know, we, we do programs, we have been doing programs with the United States State Department for 10 years now. Uh, we are now focusing on the South Caucasus, specifically with Armenia. Um, and the Middle East and, and Europe. So we're looking into you know uh, three continents uh, in our civil diplomacy programs. Um, it's a great diverse group over here, and we're very excited to be here and to partner up with ICD and to host you. Um, so before starting, I just want to thank you uh, for the collaboration and for the chance to hold this meeting. Uh, and I'd like to thank Mr. Yashar Yakish, who has actually uh, precipitated this, uh, this great partnership uh, and has been a, a great catalyzer in, in, in moving this movement uh, forward. Um, before going on, I'd just like to say a few uh, words about our movement uh, and, and our outlook towards uh, Turkey and how civil diplomacy plays into our greater vision of uh, participatory democracy and democracy itself. 
uh, we started in 1994 uh, as a movement to uh, enhance participatory democracy in Turkey and then gradually moved into the realm of international affairs and hence civil diplomacy. Um, at the onstart, we were doing conferences on international security um, uh, in, the, uh, in the near abroad of Turkey. And this year, we will be holding the 14th International Security Conference in uh, Istanbul. Uh, this time, we will be focusing uh, on uh, Syria uh, and the Middle East at large. Uh, and uh, we're hoping again to collaborate with ICD over there and perhaps hold a civil diplomacy session or a special session on civil diplomacy for this region. Um, I think since we're in Turkey and since, you know, uh, since we're in Ankara, it would be fitting to give an example on how civil diplomacy actually has helped Turkey in the past. Some of us may tend to forget, but um, uh, when we look at Turkey's foreign, uh, foreign affairs and, and the, and the uh, near history of Turkish foreign policy, the Greek rapprochement is, is a very, very uh, key, uh, key development in Turkish uh, foreign policy. Uh, when this happened, I think some of us tend to forget that civil diplomacy programs had a great input in this rapprochement. Uh, our then Foreign Minister Ismail Cem, whom Mr. Yakush knew personally and, uh, and was a friend of, uh, was actually a participant of a civil diplomacy program uh, in Harvard University called the Dukakis Program, and he was roommates with Papandrio. Uh, and that friendship, that forged friendship uh, in, in the Harvard program, the civil diplomacy program, led to a unique friendship, which uh, obviously the international conjuncture was very important, but uh, equally important was a, uh, was a friendship that was formed out of a civil diplomacy program, uh, a mutual understanding that was, that was born out of a civil diplomacy program with the Dukakis uh, Harvard University program. I'd just like to give this example because uh, there's so many more examples like this that we tend to overlook. Uh, we tend to uh, give importance, of course, to international conjuncture, which, which helps maybe the development of peace. But as an NGO representative, I, will be, I would be certainly uh, very keen on stressing the importance of uh, the multi-track, uh, you know, pursuing or pushing uh, uh, diplomacy at, at the civil level, at the cultural level forging uh, friendships and cultural liaisons across cultures so that when there's the right moment, you know, when the international conjuncture is right, the societies are also right. The leaders are also ready to move forward. Um, this, this is a vision w w which we have when we're uh, uh, doing our civil diplomacy programs, for instance, with Armenia. Uh, we are, as you know, the two states, there's a very, there's very little dialogue between the leadership and with, between the politicians. So what we're doing is we're conducting programs, for instance, between journalists, young academics, uh, young politicians between the two countries. And when the international conjuncture is right, the people of those two countries, say Armenia and Turkey, uh, will have a better understanding of the other culture, uh, have, a bit, have a better understanding of the other's politics and structure and system and all that. Um, so we're just waiting for the right moment for in the countries that we're dealing with. And Armenia was just an example. We're, mo we're hoping to expand our civil diplomacy programs across the uh, globe, uh, hopefully with the help of ICD. On that note, I'll stop. Um, and thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to be here and looking forward to learning from you. Well, thank you very much, Arda. Again, uh, honored and pleased to have you as a partner. And we also look very much forward to the developments of further activity in Turkey uh, in partnership with the RA movement. So as uh, the director of ICD, I also must say I'm a believer in uh, letting the experts do what the experts do best. Uh, so we've decided I will not be giving a keynote address uh, this morning, uh, but rather uh, I will allow uh, someone who has really served as an advisor, uh, as a mentor, and also as a visionary for the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy uh, to actually do the keynote address. Uh, someone with tremendous experience, someone who's been there, and someone who's done that in so many ways. Allow me to say a few words of welcome uh, also about His Excellency, uh, the Honorable Yasser Yakesh. As you probably know, or you may know, uh, Mr. Yasser Yakesh studied political science at the University of Ankara and entered the diplomatic service in 1962, where he held various positions, both at the ministry and abroad. In 1988, he was appointed ambassador to Saudi Arabia. In 1995, ambassador to Egypt. And in 1998, Turkey's permanent representative to the United Nations office in Vienna. In 2000, he became senior policy advisor to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. 
He taught Turkey's foreign policy at the University of Bilikens and water diplomacy at the University of Hachatepe before he co-founded the Justice and Development Party, AKP. In 2002, he was elected to the parliament and became Minister of Foreign Affairs of Turkey. He led his country's bid to start a session talks with the European Union and succeeded in easing tensions with Cyprus. He took part in drafting the European Constitution, became chairman of the EU Committee in the Turkish Parliament, and co-chairman of the Turkey-EU Joint Parliamentary Committee. His work towards developing Saudi-Turkish relations has been rewarded with the first degree of order of King Abdulaziz. He has also been decorated by the President of the Republic of Italy with the Ordine della Stella Italiana, uh, Commendatore, 2007, and by the President of the French Republic with the Légion d'Honneur, Officier, in 2009. In many ways, Mr. Yakesh, as I said, has served as an advisor uh, to me, as well as to the Institute, as a mentor, uh, as well as a visionary, in the sense one can't do a conference like this, one can't develop an institute without individuals really with vision, uh, individuals who inspire, individuals who challenge. Uh, Mr. Yakesh is the president of the Young Leaders Programs of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy. He's also the patron of the Germany Meets Turkey, a forum for young leaders program, uh, working on sustainable relations between Germany and Turkey as well as a very active member of the academic and advisory board of the Institute for Culture Diplomacy. And as I was thinking of Mr. Yakesh this morning, I was reminded of an anecdote uh, that he may have heard before. It was actually a teacher class at Humboldt University, and the professors there very often will recount a famous story about Professor Einstein. Uh, and when Professor Einstein was teaching a graduate uh, program uh, at Humboldt, uh, he actually, uh, you have to paint a picture now, this is back in time, of course, uh, Professor Einstein was uh, giving an exam, a final exam, to his graduate students. At this time, of course, there was much more formality in the classroom. Students would be wearing suits and ties. You would greet the professor, professor, doctor, doctor. And uh, anyway, much more formal than today's university settings. And you have to imagine an exam situation is even more formal. Of course, there's total silence. People take their exams. That's it. Uh, and on this day, Professor Einstein uh, distributed the exam to a room about this size, students uh, around this number. And uh, for the first five minutes, there was silence. Everyone was taking their exam. Everything seemed fine. And then all of a sudden, something very shocking happened. In the middle of the exam, one of the students raised their hand and they had a question and interrupted the entire exam. So Professor Einstein sees the students, uh, recognizes them, motions, please, you know, that they should ask their question. So the student stands up in the middle of the exam and he says, Professor Einstein, Professor Einstein, correct me if I'm wrong, but I looked at the questions on this exam and these are the same questions you asked last year on the exam. You know, did you make some mistake or, you know, is this the wrong exam? And suddenly everyone started whispering, could it be the great Professor Einstein had made a mistake and given the wrong exam? And everyone's whispering and going back and forth, what is this? And uh, Professor Einstein, uh, you know, listens to the question, sits back in his chair a little bit, uh, has a little bit of a smile on his face. And he says, yes, you're right. This year, the questions are the same as last year. However, this year, the answers are different. Please continue <laughs> taking the test. And I was thinking of Mr. Yakesh when I thought about that, because there we really discussed so many old questions, so many important questions that aren't necessarily new. But really, and I mean this sincerely, almost every time that you participate in a conference, almost every time we have also a private conversation, you give me new answers or new insights on maybe this issue or that issue. Uh, so in that sense, I'm really looking forward also this morning for you to continue that tradition, uh, to give us maybe some new answers to old questions, uh, some new insights and perspectives, and really to, to get us thinking about these issues, maybe from a different perspective uh, and maybe even a more open-minded perspective. So on that note, in the spirit of old questions and new answers, uh, I would very much ask you to please join me in a very, very sincere welcome for His Excellency, Mr. Yasser Yakesh. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Actually, if I have uh, different answers to various questions, it is because I am evolving also, despite the fact that I am a very old man of 75 years old. Uh, but uh, still I try to keep uh, my activity by uh, trying to keep pace with the young generation and this is the, one of the reasons why I accepted to be the leader of the uh, youth program in the ICD. Actually, uh, ICD is uh, an initiative for the future because cultural diplomacy is something more important for the future. It is developing, it's a new concept, and the, the limits uh, of it is, is not properly determined. A proper definition is not made yet. There are several definitions of what the uh, cultural diplomacy consists of, and uh, we are trying to contribute to this uh, evolution. 
I would like also to begin by thanking the Minister of uh, Finance, uh, which finances all the good things in, in Turkey, but also finances uh, the efforts of the uh, cultural diplomacy by making available this uh, very suitable uh, premises uh, for our purpose. And I would like to thank uh, uh, Mark Dunfried for having accepted to hold this meeting in Ankara because Turkey could be a very uh, properly designated candidate uh, as part of the cultural dialogue because Turkey is a mixture of cultures. Turkey is a country with predominant Muslim population, but a secular country located in an area uh, which is uh, at the juncture of uh, Asia and Europe in Istanbul, you cross from Asia to Europe uh, five times a day uh, across the uh, Bosphorus, and we are also close to Africa. It is the uh, joining point of the three continents. And uh, Turkey is at the same time a Middle Eastern country, a European country, negotiating country with the EU, uh, a Mediterranean country, a Caucasus country, a part of Islamic conference organization, so part of Islamic Ummah, Islamic world. So with all these uh, characters and uh, characteristics, Turkey is a country where cultural diplomacy is perhaps more important than in many countries. I will begin my presentation today by uh, making an attempt to define what the uh, cultural diplomacy consists of. I believe that there is no a universally accepted definition for cultural diplomacy. It's good that we, we don't have such a definition because before all the pros and cons of what is as component, what are as components in the uh, cultural diplomacy, if you make a definition, then we may fall captive of this definition and we may not be able to go beyond it. For this reason, uh, we have time uh, to, to uh, develop a, a proper definition. Uh, among several definitions of the cultural diplomacy, I will pick a definition which fits better the purpose of uh, today's meeting, which is uh, the title of my presentation, Cultural Diplomacy as a Tool to Build uh, Sustainable Peace. Sustainable peace, of course, cannot be achieved only with cultural diplomacy. It needs, firstly, political will of the leaders uh, between the countries. Secondly, if major uh, stakeholders have economic and commercial interest, then there are better chances for uh, cultural diplomacy to contribute to the sustainable development. I have my own definition of cultural diplomacy, and to my, uh, I was nicely surprised the other day when I was Googling for cultural diplomacy. It directed me to v Wikipedia for cultural diplomacy, and I found out that Google picked my definition as a uh, definition of reference for cultural diplomacy and uh, uh, picked a text of a speech that I made in, in Berlin in the, uh, uh, cultural, in the Institute for Cultural Development. I was proud, of course, of this definition, but during today's meeting, I will not use that definition of mine. I will use the definition of another person, of an American, uh, which says that, uh, uh, which makes a larger definition. My definition of cultural diplomacy was an effort of better mutual understanding and eliminating differences of perception between nations as a means to support foreign policy with activities in cultural areas. It's a long sentence, so you may not keep in mind. But one of the important elements in this definition 
is that the cultural diplomacy differs from an exercise of exporting the values of, the, of one country to another country. In the olden times, perhaps this was the main purpose of cultural diplomacy, to try to export the values, whereas now the cultural diplomacy moved to another area, uh, as uh, Mark mentioned, to, to create trust on the other side and to make an effort to understand the uh, values of the other country as well. Second important element in this definition is that in the cultural uh, exchange or cultural diplomacy, one culture should not be presented as it were, it were superior to the other culture. All cultures have their merits. So we have to understand the good side of the uh, of one culture before rejecting it. On the contrary, uh, the actors of the exercise should regard uh, the culture of other side as valuable as their own culture. For the purpose of this conference, uh, I will take the uh, I will pick the definition made by an American political sciences called Milton Cunnings. He says that cultural diplomacy is the exchange of idea, ideas, information, values, systems, traditions, belief, and other aspects of culture with the intention of fostering mutual understanding. You will notice in this definition that exchange of these major components of cultural diplomacy is aimed at fostering mutual understanding. In other words, if it is not aimed at this purpose, it should not be regarded as cultural diplomacy. Having thus defined the cultural diplomacy, we may now take a closer look at the main components of the sustainable peace. There are two types of uh, components. One is the components that attribute, that contribute to the establishment, to the creation of the sustainable peace. The other is components that distinguish uh, cultures of countries. Let's first see the, compon the components of the, uh, that contribute to the establishment of sustainable peace. These are political will, economic and commercial interdependence, and then the efforts to be made by cultural diplomacy. What is political will? Political will is important in establishing uh, peace with the neighboring countries. If there is no political will, the other components will not have any proper effect. In dictatorial countries, political will is the decision of one person. If he is persuaded, we may talk about the political will. If not, we cannot. In countries governed by democratic regimes, the political will is not held or expressed only by the leader or by a small group of inner circle. The majority of the public opinion has to be persuaded. Despite the fact that it looks as a more difficult task in, pra in practice, it is not. Because it's easier to persuade the public opinion to the need for peace and sustainable peace rather than persuading one dictator in certain circumstances. Because people are, by definition, in favor of peace. People do not want to send their young boys to be killed in, in wars. Sometimes we may see an exception to this general rule, even in countries of transparent uh, democracy like the United States, for instance, if the arms industry lobby becomes influential in the Congress, in the Pentagon, in the, in the White House, they may change the course of events and persuade the U.S. administration to go to war, as we have witnessed in the case of uh, Iraqi war. However, the transparency in the, in the American democracy allows the voters, 
when they go to the ballot box boxes, to make their choices in cognizance of this fact. In other words, they know beforehand that if they vote for a political party X, this party will be more inclined or less inclined to involve the United States, the state of the United States, uh, in armed conflict. So if they choose, they do it in cognizance of, of the facts. The second main component of the sustainable peace is economic and commercial in interdependence. I mentioned this as a second component, but it is sometimes more important than the political will, because when you are connected with your neighbors economically, then you try, you watch more uh, to preserve peace. Sometimes the hostilities between third countries could boost jobs in the countries that have strong defense industry. It is even claimed that wars between countries are incited by the countries that have strong defense industry, but we have to regard this as an exceptional case and also effect of life. However, the main subject of our debate here is uh, interdependent economy, so we have to focus on this. Uh, the third element was the cultural diplomacy. Cultural diplomacy could play a complementary role if the previous two components are present. Otherwise, the cultural diplomacy cannot establish peace uh, by uh, itself only. This explanation should not give the impression that the cultural diplomacy should be suspended if the previous components are not present. On the contrary, cultural diplomacy should continue to prepare the ground for the time when the circumstances uh, will be ready. These were the components that contributed to the establishment or the creation of the peace. I now turn to the second set of components, namely the components that distinguish culture of one country from the culture of the other country. Uh, there are two uh, different types. Uh, I, I would like to take this at two different levels, actually. One at the international level, the other at domestic level. At the international level, three components are important to distinguish nations uh, from each other. These are race, language, and belief. This may not apply to countries which is like the United States, which is a melting pot of races, languages, beliefs, etc. But the general rule in the nation states uh, is that we can distinguish uh, countries on these three main components, race, language, belief. As far as the cultural diplomacy is concerned, these three components are subject to different rules than the other components, such as uh, culture, ideas, thought, administration, and that type of things. When we come to race, race cannot be a subject of cultural diplomacy because you cannot change race and you cannot export it. However, belittling a race or defaming a race or praising a race as compared to the other, these are the wrong practices, examples of wrong practices of uh, cultural diplomacy. Second distinctive uh, component of the uh, culture was language. Language, exporting language or promotion of uh, teaching language in other countries, uh, this is not regarded uh, as a harmful effort by neither by the recipient countries, of course, less so by the uh, exporting countries, because it's a ve vehicle for the better understanding of culture of other countries. Furthermore, it, pro it produces 
teaching of language produces agents that facilitate the communication, interpretation, and uh, those who, the, the, the economic actors, commercial actors, when they learn language, of course, they can conduct their activity and create better interdependence in economic and commercial field. The third distinctive uh, component of the culture was the religion. In religion, missionary activities as a tool to propagate a religion are an ambiguous issues in certain countries, while it is tolerated in other countries. If a country does not allow missionary activities in its own territory, it should not criticize uh, other countries for not allowing his own country to propagate religion there. If you yourself allow other religions to be, uh, to be subject of missionary activities in your country, then you could do it in other countries. If you don't allow it in your country, then you should not try to do it in other countries. These uh, were three components that distinguish the culture of one country from the culture of another country. There are other components that distinguish the culture of one country from the culture of another country, such as ideas, information, as we have seen in the definition of Professor Canning, values, systems, traditions, and beliefs. However, these components are not uh, like the previous three components that deserved special care. These less sensitive components do not create any serious problem in the practice of cultural diplomacy. I would like to say a few words regarding the globalization. The globalization uh, in almost all fields and the spectacular developments in the field of telecommunications made the cultural diplomacy easier, but also more important. Easier because the contact with other cultures has become easier. People living in remote rural areas or in the islands scattered in the Pacific Ocean have now easy access uh, to the information regarding uh, other parts of the world, and the easy contacts, possibility of easy con contacts with people in other places. It's also more important because they are now more exposed to different cultures. Without using cultural diplomacy or without engaging in dialogue, people who are exposed to the cultures of other countries uh, may develop a distorted image about the culture that they do not understand properly. So cultural diplomacy will help them to understand the culture of the other countries better. The globalized world and the amazing progress in the field of telecommunications offer uh, extensive opportunities for cultural diplomacy and compel the actors in this field I now refer to the Cultural Institute of Cultural Diplomacy, which is one of the very early centers to make this science as an independent discipline. And uh, to compel these actors in the field to adjust themselves to this big increase in the demand for the cultural diplomacy. Uh, having said this, uh, my observation will not be complete if I do not mention the need for dialogue and if not cultural diplomacy at the domestic level. At the domestic level, we may not call it uh, cultural diplomacy because diplomacy means relations between countries. But you could also use diplomacy to gain the heart of your girlfriend. You say diplomacy again. So, Diplomacy is a way of handling things. So uh, despite the fact that cultural diplomacy has a connotation that it should take place between countries, 
sometimes it is also necessary to apply cultural diplomacy at the domestic level between different cultures in the, I have five minutes, okay. I will finish before five minutes, thank you. Uh, Huntington predicted that the clash of civilization uh, at the international will take place. Uh, it, he said that this is going to take place uh, between the countries or blocks of countries. Whether this forecast turned out to be true is still debatable. However, the clash <coughs> of the civilization has already started to emerge in other theaters, that's to say at the domestic level. It exists in the form of xenophobia in many European countries. If sustainable peace is to be established, it has to be established both at the national and domestic level. Therefore, the need for engaged in intercultural dialogue is valid both at national and international level. If countries cannot achieve this dialogue within their own country, they should not make an effort to promote their culture in other countries. It will, be, it will not be fair. Uh, the cultural uh, and linguistic difference are sometimes a pretext to hide other interests. In countries like uh, Belgium and uh, Northern Ireland, uh, they enjoy the same culture almost because they live together, but there are still differences, but it is not the subject of, uh, of this uh, uh, meeting. So I would like to conclude uh, by saying that in, the, in light of the, this explanation that I gave, one should not exaggerate the importance of cultural diplomacy. However, one should not minimize it either. Cultural diplomacy is not a pill that cures all diseases because all hostilities do not stem from misunderstanding and misperceptions. There are other reasons for conflicts and cultural diplomacy cannot do anything for that type of things. Many conflicts may persist despite the fact that the parties to a conflict understand each other, understand each other's culture uh, to a great extent, but despite this, the conflict is still there. To conclude, the cultural diplomacy is a must to achieve sustainable peace, however, if other components of sustainable peace, that's to say political will, economic interdependence are not there, cultural dialogue alone will not be sufficient to secure sustainable peace. If other components are secured, then cultural diplomacy, and as a result of this mutual understanding of each other's culture, will definitely make the peace more sustainable. Thank you very much for your attention. Did I make it before five minutes? Okay. Thank you.